Jesus was not Clark Kent. He was not God pretending or dressed up like man. His humanity was every bit as real as his deity. Welcome to the Sound Words Podcast, where our goal is to help Christians love and live out God's Word. I'm Jesse Randolph. I'm the pastor teacher of Indian Hills Community Church, and I'm here with Dr. Doug Bookman from Shepherd's Theological Seminary. Dr. Bookman, welcome to the Sound Words Podcast. Well, thank you so much. Glad to have you on, and you uh, have been a great blessing to our church and have ministered here even a couple of times in recent years, so it's great to have you as a guest. Uh, Dr. Bookman is Professor of Old and New Testament and Bible Exposition at Shepherd's Theological Seminary. Uh, He has a particular focus and interest in biblical archaeology, the land of the Bible, and the life of Christ. And that last topic I just mentioned, the life of Christ, is really going to be the focus for our podcast uh, today. So that's why we've had Dr. Bookman come on. He's preached on this topic at our church, in fact. And I'm just going to lead right into that question, uh, Dr. Bookman. You have read, you've written, you've taught extensively on the humanity of Jesus Christ. So if you would, could you could you put us in his shoes, humanly speaking, uh, for a few minutes, and just tell us, uh, what was he like as a person, as the Bible reveals it? What, what would he have been like? Well, let me say, first of all, thank you so much. At any chance I get to talk about the life Jesus lived and the man the God-man, but the man, Jesus Christ, is uh, an absolute delight to me. And certainly, it's it's a spontaneous question. Of what, you know, what would it have been like? Uh, I have a series uh, where I talk about Jesus' boyhood, and I entitle it The Kid Down the Street, because that's what he, he would have been, to be honest with you. Uh, there is, and we'll talk maybe a little bit about it later on, but there is a tendency to underappreciate the real humanity of Jesus, and uh, and I think it's so important to consciously, deliberately factor in, to acknowledge the mystery in the person of Jesus, but to factor in all that the Bible teaches. And it teaches that the second person of an eternal triune Godhead mysteriously took upon himself genuine human nature. And uh, to answer the question specifically, I, I think it's healthy to maybe go for a minute to a passage It's in Luke chapter 4, and I'm going to be very quick with it. But in Luke chapter 4, Jesus returns to Nazareth. Now, he was reared in Nazareth. I I will argue that he was, I think the Bible is quite clear that he was taken to Nazareth as a babe in arms, just months old after his mother and father, of course, uh, had fled to Egypt to escape Herod the Great, and then had come back and heard that Archelaus was going to reign. They moved up to Nazareth, and from that time, until Jesus went to be baptized by John, which was at the age, oh, he was just about to turn 30, according to Luke chapter 3, Jesus lived among the Nazarenes. It's a small village, and uh, everybody knew Jesus, knew the whole family. Now, sometime just weeks or months before Luke 4, Jesus had taken his family uh, from Nazareth. Jesus himself, who was by now, I think, given the death of his adopted father, which seems quite clear. Jesus had moved his family, had gone to Capernaum. But now, it's early in the Galilean ministry, comes back to Nazareth, and I won't get into it, but given the protocols of synagogue, uh, prayer services, and so on, he comes to the synagogue, and and, and Luke bends himself out of shape in Luke 4.16, and he says he went to the village where he had been reared, and then he went to the synagogue, and I think it's better read that it was his custom to go to. So the point is that now as an adult, having quit the little village of Nazareth and moved his family to Capernaum, but now he comes back. And by the way, by now he is a local boy made good, if you don't mind, because he grew up in this little tiny village. He went to the synagogue school with all these other boys and so on. Uh, he, he, he became a, he, he, uh, I shouldn't kick over any can of worms here, should I, Jesse? But <laughs> kick but, away. Uh, it's it's my persuasion that Jesus was in fact a, a stonemason, that Joseph was a stonemason, simply because he is described. Both Joseph and Jesus in Matthew thirteen are described as uh, they're they're identified as. Well, the word that's often it's usually translated carpenter, but it's the Greek word tekton, and it means builder. And in Israel, you don't and you never did build with wood; you built with stone. But at any rate. 
these people in Nazareth had known him through his entire life. They had known him first as a boy and a synagogue student and then a bar mitzvah boy and then a, an apprentice to his father. And then I think a stonemason, perhaps apprenticing his own, his own brothers. But the point is, now he's left town and we here in Nazareth have heard, number one, there was a, a, a significant stir about something that happened to a wedding just a few miles away a few weeks ago. But beyond that, uh, Jesus, of course, we heard had had amazingly driven out the money changers and the merchants from the temple. And that was one of the most, I, I always say, that was, I don't care, everybody was there that day. That was the most exciting thing that had ever happened in their life. There was a woman there who had had quintuplets a couple of weeks ago. That paled compared to what Jesus did <laughs> when he cleansed the temple. So the word has gotten back to Nazareth, and, and, and we know something's going on. And then Jesus participates in a synagogue service. I won't get into it, but he is invited to read the Isaiah scroll. And he reads one of the most unmistakably, universally recognized Messianic passages. Nobody would doubt that this passage is talking about the Messiah, Isaiah 61. And then he he rolls the scroll up, hands it back, sits down. You always stand to read, sit to preach. Every eye is upon him. Everybody is just so... I mean, you've got to kind of get yourself in a moment. This is a local boy made good, and he's come back to Tower, and it's so exciting. And now he reads from the scroll, and then he turns to the people, and the Bible says that all eyes were upon him. Everybody was just so anxious to hear what he had to say about that text. And all he said was, this day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. And there was nobody in that room who didn't understand that he was claiming to be Messiah. And the response throughout the room, I need to time out here real quick. There are a lot of false stories. There are total lies about Jesus doing all sorts of miracles when he was a boy and, you know, taking little clay doves that he'd fashioned and blowing on them and they fly away. And so the point is now, now come back to me. Jesus is all, he's 30 years of age. He has come back to his home village. He has been invited to participate in the synagogue service. He had read a messianic passage and claimed to be the fulfillment of that passage. And everybody in the room said, what's going on here? Is this not Joseph's son? Now, nobody in the room said that we knew there was something about this kid ever since he blew on those little clay doves and they, they went flying away. In other words, when Jesus claimed in the face of the people who had known him through every single season of life, for 30 years in a small village where everybody knew everybody. When he claimed to be the Messiah, everybody was absolutely dumbstruck amazed. And their attitude was, this can't be, this is Joseph's son. Where am I going with that? You asked the question, what would it have been like? And I maintain that the one word you have to write over Jesus' life for those 30 years, and I would argue that absent except for the miracles that he did, if you had lived with him during the years of his ministry, the one word you have to write over his his entire life in terms of what was he like is normal. Hmm. He was normal, so normal that people who, as I say, know him in every season, every scene of life, uh, they were absolutely, I mean, nobody ever suspected that this boy was anything. Now, I always say that some of the kids who grew up alongside of him may still have been just a little bit blistered about what he did to the grading curve in synagogue school, you know, but <laughs> but as far as as glowing in the dark or having a halo, it was nothing about him and, and the way he lived his life. He got hungry, he got sleepy, all the normal elements of life were entirely true of Jesus. So yeah, I think I, I, he was certainly a winsome personality. I would expect even given the, the narratives we have, his like, reunion with his mother after he'd gone off to be baptized and then tempted and was gone for four months and Caesar there in Cana, and the way he so delicately, lovingly, winsomely explains to her that life's going to be different now, that the father has pressed him in to his messianic role and so on. So and every, the way he dealt with his brothers to where they finally came to believe in him, every indication is that he would have been nice, he would have been gentle, he would have been noble, he would have been certainly forthright. So I'm sure in every way he was a model. He was unfallen humanity. So yeah. he was 
humanity not colored by sin. But uh, as far as any sort of manifest or palpable evidence that he was uh, divine, it just, uh, it, it's not there. He lives a normal life, although one that would have been stunningly and delightfully noble. Hmm. Two things I appreciate about that answer, Dr. Bookman. One, number one, how thorough you are in, in that answer. You covered so much. I think you might have taken two breaths in giving, the, giving that entire answer, but it's so thorough in, what, in weaving through in just a few minutes uh, so much about the life and the humanity of Christ. Second, how thoroughly biblical that answer is. Because everything you're pulling from is, is scripture, whether it be Luke 4 or cross-references to different aspects of the life, the humanity of Christ, and also distinguishing some of the pseudepigraphal accounts, the, the false accounts of who Jesus was, the doves and all of that. So thank you for, for that thorough response. I have a follow-up question. Take us, if you will, down the path of how do we think about as Christians the connection between the, the fact of the humanity of Christ and the event of the incarnation of Christ. How do those two tie into each other? Why are those two essential for a Christian to believe in? Yeah, so very, very important. And quite frankly, well, let me just start this way, Jesse. There are a number of points, times, in Christian thought, Christian doctrine, biblical thought, where you get this intimate interplay, I like to call it, between the divine and the human. Hmm. You have it in prayer, for heaven's sakes. You have it in in the work of sanctification. I like to say with in that regard that you can reduce the whole moral universe to these two realities. If anything good happens, God gets all the glory. And if anything bad happens, we get all the blame. (laughs) So how do you really sort out in any sort of definitive or, if you don't mind, uh, uh, deeply analytical way the interplay between the divine and the human, for instance, in sanctification, you don't. You simply don't. You'll never get there. Uh, what you do is you bow the knee happily, humbly to everything the Bible says. And what the Bible says, I mean, it's so absolutely undeniably crystal clear, is that Jesus was, in fact, God, very God, who took upon himself genuine, unfallen humanity. He was man, very man. Now, there is bottomless and delightful ministry in that. Some people will simply say, well, acknowledge the tension. And I maintain, don't just acknowledge it, celebrate it, wallow in it. We serve a God who runs a moral universe, which involves elements totally beyond us. But that's all right. That's the kind of God I'd like to serve, not one that's just me blown big, you know, can't do anything I can't understand. So you have in the person of Jesus this reality that you just mentioned. You've got the God-man, and it's so tempting or so easy to fall into one ditch or the other. So in answer to your question, I would say you got to kind of come at that question with two distinct perceptions or perspectives is the word I want. Calibrate your head to be careful about what you're thinking about. Hmm. Because if you're thinking ontologically as to his essence, as to his person, and I'm happy with the Nicene expression, one person, two natures. I think it's a separate, uh, you know, the, the, you, this deity to become humanity, this humanity to become deity. You don't have two Jesus, one out here thinking it this way. There's one person, two natures. And I, I'm going to say again, this is bottomlessly inscrutable. It is unspeakably important. And it is inexpressibly blessed hmm. because it was only by reason of the fact that this God man, that is that the second person of a triumph God had took upon himself genuine humanity. It was only because of that, that uh, he, on the one hand, could be our redeemer, can't be our redeemer if he's not a kinsman. Hebrews chapter four, didn't right. take upon himself the nature of angels. And secondly, it's only because of that reality that he can be a high priest genuinely touched with the feeling of our infirmity. So in every way, it's so ontologically, when you have clearly revealed truths which transcend our capacity to understand in their relationship. That's okay. But what you do is you bow the knee to everything the Bible says. And I'm going to say again, it couldn't be more clear that Jesus is God, very God. He was God from eternity. And then he took upon himself at a point in time when he was conceived by the Spirit's ministry in his mother's womb. He took upon himself genuine humanity. He becomes the God-man. So 
ontologically, just a sort of a doctrinal statement, Jesus was God, very God, man, very man. Amen and amen. Ah, a different perspective. Hmm. And that is the life that he lived. And the life that he lived, when Jesus was baptized, the Spirit of God came upon him. And some people will spend a lot of time saying, well, what's going on there? Well, we have, throughout the Old Testament, ample evidence as to what's going on, the precedent, and I think evidence. And that is this theocratic anointing, as theologians call it, all throughout the Old Testament. There would be this or that individual who was given a task for the by King Yahweh, and the Spirit of God would come upon that person in a very special way usually mundane. And the reason was because the person could not do what God had assigned him without the Spirit, by reason of who that person was. I like to say, forgive me here, that uh, I think Samson was about four foot nine and had a pot belly and spoke with a high voice and (laughs) and probably had a pocket protector, if you know what I'm saying. But (laughs) but, but I'm being silly there, but my point is it was because he was such a muscle-up guy that he was able to carry the gates off. It was because the Spirit of God came upon him. It was manifest. Well, What happened at the baptism was the theocratic anointing, this special ministry equipping, enabling ministry of the Spirit, came upon Jesus, now hear me on this, to enable him to do what God had called him to do in terms of offering himself as Messiah. But in the case of everybody in the Old Testament that was thus blessed, that person, those persons all needed that ministry of the Spirit because of who they were. Jesus stood in need of that ministry of the Spirit because of who he had chosen to become. Hmm. He take about himself genuine, the limitations of genuine unfallen humanity. And so he was dependent upon the Spirit. And to come back to the question, how do we think about it? I would say with regard to ontology, ontology means essence, you know, the fifth essence of who he is. In that regard, he was God, very God, man, very man. Amen and amen. We never want to forget that. As far as reading the text, the the stories, the narratives, I think we need to realize that Jesus, in taking upon himself uh, genuine humanity, he lived out day by day a very normal life, a real human life. Now, there is bottomless mystery in that, but it's exactly what the Bible teaches. I, I tell people all the time, I, I see it again and again, that, that Christians, and I mean generally good thinking, deliberate, well-trained Christians, they tend to underappreciate the reality of Jesus' humanity, not in terms of their doctrine, because they'll sign a doctrine and say it was absolutely explicit, but in terms of the way they actually read the narratives. And they come to this or that story in Jesus' life, and they kind of, I think witlessly, although I think it's careless, but not, not deliberately, but but they read that story and they kind of assume that Jesus was living it out at some plane entirely different from our own. He was, he, you know, he, he walked into a room and everybody got, a, got became robots and they had to do exactly what he intended. And, and he was, that's not what the Bible teaches. And, and, and that's what I call the Clark Kent approach to the life of Jesus. And what I mean by that is, I think we all know the story, there never was a Clark Kent that was Superman pretending and carefully hiding his capacities. Jesus was not Clark Kent. He was not God pretending or dressed up like man. His humanity was every bit as real as his deity. Now, let me say two things in that regard, and I'll quit this. But number one, I would really encourage all of us, and and, uh, listen, this was a pilgrimage I walked through rather consciously many, many decades ago, I'll confess that, where I began to take seriously the genuine humanity, the genuine limitations, the genuine dependence. You know, when Jesus was on earth, he had no more spiritual resources than you and I. He, he, why was it, why would he spend a whole night in prayer? Was that some sort of play act? No, he depended upon those things. As so my point is, you begin to read the text and you deliberately factor in this reality that Jesus is living a life so much more like ours, so stunningly more like ours than we that we tend to acknowledge. So my point is that that I would encourage people to calibrate your head, read those stories, understand that Jesus, those questions are real, the frustration is real. He's not walking through some pre-scripted drama that he memorized his lines for and dirty past. This is real life. This is real drama. This is real terror. This is 
uh, that, that, that Jesus, uh, uh, he, he learned obedience through the things which he suffered. He says explicitly. So, number one, my point would be just be deliberate about acknowledging and celebrating and factoring in the reality of Jesus' humanity as you read the narratives in the Gospels. The second thing is, and this may be a little provocative, but it's not mine, and so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to appeal to it. Bruce Ware, theologian from Southern Baptist Seminary, the most important voice of our generation in defense of, I say defense of, more celebration of, uh, uh, highlighting and, and drawing our attention to so nobly the reality of Jesus' humanity. Where was asked this specific question? What role did Jesus' deity play in the actual day-by-day life that he lived? And his answer was, now hold on out there in viewer land, but I think it's true. I'd ask you to at least contemplate it. He was asked, what role did Jesus' deity play in the life that Jesus lived? And his answer was, it is irrelevant. It's not irrelevant ontologically. And I know people are going to say, well, wait a minute. He did all those miracles. Yeah, but he did those miracles by the power of the Spirit. Oh, my goodness. The Bible is so explicit in this regard that Jesus was dependent upon the Spirit, either to instruct him to utilize his divine powers or just to give him the power either way. But it was the just as you and I are dependent upon the Spirit, he was dependent upon the Spirit. So, Two perspectives, ontologically the God-man, as far as the life that he lived, every single indication of the Gospels is, he lived a life that was stunningly normal in order that he may be, first of all, our kinsman redeemer, and then our uh, high priest actually touched with the feeling of our weaknesses. Hmm. Do you believe, and I know you've studied this topic deeply, do you think that some of this Clark Kent syndrome, as you've called it, Maybe this um, hyperemphasis on the uh, the deity or the ontological reality of who Christ is eternally, focusing on that in his life, is a kickback or a push against all the Arian heresies or all the heresies about you know who was Christ truly God. So what I'm trying to say is, there, is there this fear that we're undermining his deity? So in doing so, we overemphasize his deity to the detriment of his humanity when we study the life of Christ. I think that's exactly it, Jesse. I'm so glad you mentioned it because, I mean, it took an—you had Arius in the fourth, and then you have Athanasius straight on, and then you have the, the ascetic thing, you know, mm-hmm. and, and uh, a docetism for the sake of our audience. Arianism was the denial of Jesus' deity, and that was set straight. But then the, the early Christians began to say, well, if he's really God, then he couldn't be really human. So you get docetism, and that docetism it means Jesus just was Clark Kent. He was dressed up. Listen. If you're going to tend toward one ditch or the other, <laughs> don't do it. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> but if you're going to tend, you're going to lean one way or the other. Good heavens, you know, better to struggle with docetism than with Arianism. For In other words, that doesn't make sense to a lot of people. I I honor the fact that in, in, in I think, in virtually every instance, people who react against an emphasis on his humanity are right. doing so because they're thinking, oh, you're playing fast and loose with his deity. We're not. This is absolutely right down the middle of the road orthodoxy. The only question is, how do we take that very orthodox doctrine of the God-man, acknowledging all of its parts, and read the scripture narratives honestly in light of that? And so, yeah, I, I, that's a very, very good point. So you're, you're going back to Dr. Ware then and his irrelevant answer. You're really saying there is no ditch uh, hold to both truths equally because both are revealed equally in the scripture. Absolutely. And it it just, in every way it becomes, I, I tell people, I think the gospels have become technicolor. If you begin to say, wait a minute, you mean Jesus was really frustrated? You know, how long have I been with you? You know, and and, uh, and then they're a lot more significant and, 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 and quite frankly, painful elements, you know. But uh, yeah, it's, it's, that's well said. Just stay on the middle road that, that, that is exactly what the Bible teaches. Amen. Well, that last line, ex- staying on the road with the Bible teaches, is a, a good place for us to end. Dr. Bookman, I could talk to you all afternoon, but for those of us who are listening or those who are tuning in and watching, this is 
Um, going to be just such a great episode for them to chew on and think critically and biblically, most importantly, about what they un- know and understand about the deity of Christ and to know and understand what they know or what the Bible teaches about the humanity of Christ, to hold those truths equally, to hold them in balance, to recognize, as you said, there's mystery there, there's tension that's kind of built in, uh, that God, who is all wise, has revealed both to us, so we take them both as true on faith and having been revealed in, in the scriptures themselves. We don't overemphasize one to the detriment of the other. This has been great. So thank you very much, Dr. Bookman, for blessing us with your time and your wisdom on the Sound Words podcast. Well, thank you so much, Jesse, and uh, praise God for what he's doing there at uh, in, in Lincoln. We, we delight in it. Wonderful. Well, we'll have to have you out here again one of these days, maybe when it's a little warmer, because last time you came, it was cold outside. Yeah, you remember that. <laughs> Great. Well, thanks so much for tuning in to the Sound Words podcast. As always, the final word is going to go to God and His Word from 2 Timothy 1.13, which says, Retain the standard of sound words which you've heard from me in the faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. We'll see you next time.